Well, let's start with our moms first. So uh, again, officially, Happy Mother's Day <laughs> to all our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, our ladies, our women, our queens, um, young and old, by the way, single or married. We, we want to honor all of you today. Um, this is a great day just to pause, right? It's, it's cool that our nation does it. This isn't just a spiritual exercise. That the nation actually pauses to give respect and reverence, um, esteem and extol women. You know, mothers in particular. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, right? So, uh, ladies, you have incredible impact just by, by raising kids. So we want to value and honor you today. Um, let me say in a kind of a authoritative, sobering way, you have a very strategic role a very strategic role not only in the kingdom of God and in the progress of the world and in the edification of the church and in the stability and rhythm of the home but just in God's marvelous wonderful plan you guys are fantastic and I hope you feel affirmed and I hope uh, you know we as men can do our part in reminding you you are significant again in the kingdom in the world in the church and in the home so thank you ladies <laughs> you're really vital to the kind of the harmony and the hope of our lives and you you're, you bless us you're just wonderfully complex and gracious and ladies you you have a refinement and a composure and an elegance that us men just don't have you can be a little perplexing and puzzling at times but hey <laughs> the variegation and the intricacy and the mystery is so wonderful <laughs> and uh, i'm certainly grateful for sue and uh, grateful for our our daughters as well i was um at walmart yesterday looking for cards and stuff and to be honest with you, like none of the cards were good enough for my wife. I mean, sweetie, you, you're an amazing mom. I, I, I know some of you are like this, but her whole calling and vocation is mothering. Um, like nothing resonates more. It's interesting as I'm watching protests around the country and people protesting the Roe versus Wade stuff. And I, I'm like, what is broken in so many people that they don't have a nurturing, mothering, protective instinct for the most vulnerable and the, the most need. It's like something's wrong. I'm okay with your body, your choice. I really am. But what about the baby's body? That's what I'm concerned about. I don't want to tell you what to do with your body, but we have another life involved. And the fact that your life doesn't think about that, it's just, and I, I just am so grateful, Sue, and many of you, you just, you love the mothering part of life. You're nurturing not only to our children, but to, to me and to our, our fellowship. It's super cool. So thank you. And thank you to my own mom, who's not here today. She's uh, taking care of my dad a little bit. But we had uh, lunch with her yesterday. Super cool. Went to IHOP. And I have not been to IHOP in a long time. That's still good, people. <laughs> Chase, let me try some of those chocolate pancakes. I'm like, that's legit. <laughs> that was super cool. <laughs> So I was looking at cards, couldn't find one exactly for uh, my wife. I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't say enough. But I found a few that I thought I'd share with you. One card on the outside, it says, I want you to have a happy Mother's Day. And then in huge letters, because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> then you open it up. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a rush. I am drunk with power. No wonder you say that so much. <laughs> <laughs> because I said so. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Um, one card said to a mom who brought home the bacon, and then you open it up and put up with my baloney. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I could get that one. That's true. Um, another one says to my wife, since it's Mother's Day, you just relax. I will take care of everything. Then you open it up. By the way, where is everything? <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. 
Um, one said, things moms love. Using coupons, threatening to count to three, putting on a sweater when they feel a draft, asking if you ate today, talking too loud on the phone, blah, blah, blah. Having decorative pillows that no one can touch. <laughs> Texting the wrong person. <laughs> and then the, you open it up <laughs> inside. It says things I love. You and tacos. <laughs> but mostly you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Uh, one more. It says uh, it's Mother's Day and you are queen for a day. So hopefully, ladies, you feel that way. And you open it up inside. Of course, without all that cumbersome wealth and those pesky servants, of course. <laughs> you don't want that, but happy Mother's Day. So, ladies, I hope you do feel uh, like a queen today. We're, we're glad you're here, and uh, if you're online with us, we're grateful for who you are. You, you just make a significant difference. And today we're going to be talking about eschatology and revelation, and it could feel so disconnected, but the reality is God's plan for the ages includes women, and you have a vital part uh, one of the things about the future is a lot of people are like, oh, don't get in Revelation, it's too scary, it's too this, it's too that. And it's like, you ladies can really help us to not fear the future. That we have each other. That we have love. And that grace will help win the day. And no matter what happens, we can get through it. I mean, that's one of your, your vital contributions to the world. Revelation, as you know, is a, it's really a book about, it's a vision of victory for the people of God who want to be loyal to, to God, but they want to be loyal to the state too, but the state's becoming tyrannical and mandating, canceling things. And what do they do when their loyalties to their citizenship in heaven is getting rivaled by their citizenship on earth? This whole book is about how do you deal with that tension? This book, Revelation, is a revelation about Jesus Christ. So ultimately, if someone says, what's Revelation about? It's a revealing, a pulling back the curtain about Jesus and that he's the victor, that he's winning and will win. And when you think like, it doesn't seem like we're winning. Well, of course, what you see doesn't look like we're winning, but behind the scenes, some stuff is happening and it's all gonna fall into place in due time. So hang in there. Um, this book is a reminder um, that we're in a spiritual war. I, I know you guys know that, but when you look around, it's, I mean, hopefully you see, there is a spiritual reality going on behind all the cuckoo-ness you're seeing. I mean, behind the Roe versus Wade is death, satanic worship, evil, demons, people who've colluded, with this, the, the kingdoms of darkness uh, un underneath all this. Because you're like, wow, this is crazy land. You're going to be protesting outside a judge's home? Really? Wow. Yeah, it's just savage. And uh, there's a battle for beliefs, and there is a, a contest for convictions that's going on behind everything. That's super important just in the sense that you and I are reminded Pelosi or Schumer or Biden or whoever, they're not the problem. Like our battles are really not against flesh and blood. Uh, there may be instruments of things that they do that we don't like or seem contrary to things of God. Uh, I think Macron does a lot of things contrary to things of God. Trudeau does a lot of things contrary to things of God. But they're not really our problem. There's something much deeper and graver behind that. And that's important because Revelation reminds us a conflict uh, exists between God and Satan, the lamb and the dragon, the church and the world, the bride and the harlot, the holy city of Jerusalem, the great city of Babylon, those who are marked out by God, and those who will eventually take the mark of the beast. There's this conflict of these, these differences going on. I don't mind reminding you before we look at our chart today as well that remember the third verse of this book in chapter 1 verse 3 it says this blessed blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy this is blessings like in the Beatitudes and blessed are those who hear it present tense continually hear it regularly hear it and uh, take heart what is written in it because the time is near or impending. 
This is the only book I know of in the New Testament, of all 27 New Testament books, that says you'll actually be blessed if you read aloud this book. You'll actually be blessed if you study this word, if you listen to this word, if you read this word, but more importantly, if you do it. You'll be blessed knowing behind all the symbolism and the chaos and the dragons and the beasts and the, the t exactly, the screaming and the temptations and oh, it's just all of that. You'll be blessed if you are into this book because you'll know we win. It should settle your spirit. Like, okay, we're going through hard times, but we're going to win. Like, and uh, our king is on the throne and all that good stuff. So I, I didn't mind taking today before we look again at kind of this unfolding drama that this book is designed to bless you. By the way, it, I, think about it. One of the reasons Satan doesn't want us to read this book that he scares people like, don't read that book, it's super scary, weird symbolism, stay away, it's like icky, it's an icky book, is this book talks about him being utterly defeated and thrown into the lake of fire. Of course he doesn't want you to read this book. He's totally like taken out, like you're, he's a total loser in this book. So he doesn't want us to read it, but we are reading it. And we got the outline in chapter one, verse nine, remember, um, Jesus gives John this revelation right there for three things. What you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. This is the only New Testament book I'm aware of. The outline of the book is given to you in the first chapter. What he saw was Jesus walking among the seven lampstands. Remember that Jesus is present. He's with us. Even when you're being persecuted or you feel like life's overwhelming or everything's falling apart. No, Jesus is right there. And then write what is now. And he gave letters to seven of the churches. Here's what's going on right now. In the church age, through the churches, you're a little bit lukewarm. Some of you have lost your first love. Look, you're redeemed. You're, you're, we're on the, you're on the right team, but we're not going to make a difference in the world if we're like half in, half out. You can't be compromised like that. You've got to be solid. So he talks about those seven churches. And then he moves on to the things that will take place after. And now that's what we're in now. The whole book now is the future. What is ahead for us? So it's super cool. And then a couple other notes before we jump into our chart, and that is that, remember, Revelation is a revealing of reality. It's a revealing of a reality that you and I wouldn't naturally understand or see just in our natural capacities. It is an unveiling. It is pulling the curtain back so that you see the matrix behind what's happening. This is the red pill document to help you to understand what may not be so obvious on the outside. So it is kind of an awakening to truth and reality and actuality behind everything. So when you see a world leader come on the scene that promises peace and freedom, which we've seen before with Adolf Hitler and others, and you won't be shocked because he's pulled the curtain back and said, look, a deceiver is coming. The world is gonna move towards globalism. They love globalism. They wanna get back to Babel. I had, God had already scattered them in, in Genesis 11, but they're gonna try to bring everyone back into a European Union. We're gonna be one world order nightmare. But we're not gonna be surprised because he's, he's like, I'll tell you what they're trying to do. They're trying to be God. They want you to worship the state. They, they don't want any God. They're, they're going to try to take you out. And we're going to be not thrilled about that, but we're going to be okay because it's like we get it. We know how the script works out. And it does get tough for a while, um, but we win in the end. Which reminds me, and here's a final quote before we jump into our chart today. And that is, I was reading Billy Graham and he, what a great guy. I mean, just such a cool cat. He did some writing about Revelation as well. And I was reading one quote stood out I wanted to share with you. And he wrote this, because Christianity is really not for, I don't know how to say it, wimps. Um, it's for warriors and warriorettes. It's for fighters. Uh, Christianity is for people who are willing to go the narrow road. 
not the wide road of popularity that everyone goes that leads to destruction. It's for people who have morals, convictions, live within certain lane lines, are willing to submit themselves to a higher authority. Um, I love it when you're speaking in tongues, right, in the sanctuary like that, you know. <laughs> you can hear all the spiritual gifts. Are you loving this? This sermon's amazing, isn't it? It's captivating. He's like, this stuff is so good. I love it. Anyways, Billy Graham said uh, this, and I thought it was interesting. He says, and, and he wrote this at the end of his life. Um, I look back on many years as an evangelist, and I wonder, have I made the Christian faith look too easy? Even by, before I heard the expression, he writes, I've constantly borne in mind what Bonhoeffer wrote. Of course, Bonhoeffer was killed by the Nazis in, uh, during World War II called cheap grace. Of course, he says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your works. No one can boast. It's God's grace. And of course, our salvation is a result of what Christ has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection, not what we do for ourselves. And of course, we must trust him to complete in us what he began. Yes, that's all true. But he says, in my eagerness to give away God's great gift, have I been honest about the price he paid in his war with evil. And it's easy to talk about the cross and say that, you know, it's a symbol of his love for us, but he absorbed all of God's wrath. God is utterly wrathful against sin and evil and judgment. And he took that out on Christ in on our behalf. But then he goes on to write, and have I adequately explained the price we must pay in our war against the evil at work in and around our lives. That's interesting to hear from like the world's greatest evangelist. I wonder in looking back, have I made Christianity sound too easy, too simple in my eagerness to give that free gift away have I adequately reminded people, but it, it will take all of you. Like, it is free, but you have to give him everything. And by the way, the world that hated me and crucified me will hate and want to crucify you because the disciple is not above his master. And I don't want you to come to faith thinking you're going to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory or, you know, that Jesus is Dr. Doolittle or, you know, the, the happy man. He, he was a man of sorrows. <clears throat> he was a man who was honest in a, a world that lies. They just lie. <laughs> you can turn on the news any night. You'll just be inundated with lie after lie after lie. And uh, you can show them, I don't know, 2,000 mules, and they'll still go, oh, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was the safest, most secure election we've ever had. Like, whatever. So, I think as we go into today's uh, review of uh, kind of the, the history of the world, I want you to know, ladies, you're a big part of it. Uh, you remind us that this is something we don't need to be scared of. The future is ours. You can help us stay grounded. Uh, men, I know you're warriors, you're protectors, you know, <laughs> got a lot of good dudes in here. But we need the affirmation of ladies with us to kind of go, we're, we're going to make it. We've got God on our side. We win in the end. So let me show you uh, the chart we're going to be looking at today, and I'll hand it out for you in a little bit. Let's see. So... Let me start with our chart. You're going to get one of these little guys. So hopefully you have glasses with you because I was like, why did I make this so small? <laughs> I wanted it to fit in your Bible, but you really need like the full, you need the poster, you know, that you fold up, but uh, you're going to get this. So anyways, on this chart, if Jerome can get it to us and we'll, we'll slide it over so we can see it. Um, what I put on there was from the very beginning. And if I were to add anything to this chart, which isn't on the chart, I would put a tree at the beginning and a tree at the end. Well, at least the charts work. Oh! Does it scroll, dude? 
That'd be awesome. Oh, there we go. That's perfect. Leave it right there and bring that over here. That's perfect. See, I, I have this whole chart, but I'm like, if they see the whole chart, they'll get overwhelmed. Let's just do it the little piece of a little. Jerome for the win. Yeah, so you're going to get a whole chart, but we'll start with just a little piece. So what are, if I were to add, I'd add a little tree here with Adam and Eve, you know, and you'd be in the garden and then get them kicked out and then we get into time and stuff. So what you're going to see on the chart is super simple here. Patriarchs, judges, prophets, kings. I put a little judge symbol, little scroll, little king symbol, <laughs> whatever. I didn't know how to do it. But I want you to know there's, there's a, in this purple section a series of th ways God has used men and women to lead the people of God and he led them through patriarchs like Abraham he led them through judges like Samson. He led them, and Deborah. He led them through prophets and then led them through a series of kings, Saul and Solomon, David. So there's, there's a, just a little section here that there's a lot of history in the Old Testament of God leading through various people. And I put here also a number of kingdoms, Persian, Greece, Egyptian, Maccabean, and Roman. Just so that you know, I, there's a lot of history in there and it's super condensed, but there are whole empires that God used to bring us to the time of Christ when he chose to like intervene in human history. So that brings us to what we call the church age. So I get to add this little s section here. So here, um, starting in the yellow, we're, this black dot is where I think we are in human history. You know, this is when you're at the mall and it says, you are here. <laughs> you are here, a little black dot. And from Pentecost to the next event, which is the rapture, that is Christ coming back to take us out, uh, we are in what's called the church age. This is an age of grace. This is an age, it began on Pentecost. It didn't come when Jesus just was resurrected. Remember, he said, I'm resurrected. And then he kind of stayed 40 days with them and then told the disciples, don't go anywhere until you receive power from on high. Just like trying to reproduce my principles is not Christianity. You need me to live through you. You need the power source. And 10 days later, the 50th day, Penta, um, Pentagon, Pentagram, Pentecost, um, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Here's my Holy Spirit symbol. What do you think? Pretty good, right? Art class? There you go. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit comes and we move into the church age, the day of Pentecost, when we're indwelled with the Holy Spirit and now can live out a spirit-filled life. And this is where we are from the time of Christ. The next big event going up is the rapture. Well, we'll meet him up here. And the Bema seat is for those who are in heaven. They'll actually get rewarded. So we are in the church age which means now that we're looking at Revelation, this is the best time to share Christ with people because it's the easiest. The Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit can animate people, illuminate them. We're not in the tribulation yet. We're not in the future like unfolding of the end of time stuff. So let's get strong on sharing with people. You can know Christ. There may not be many, but we already knew that. We already knew that. The way was narrow and few would find it. That's not new. So don't expect everyone, but someone wants to know Christ and someone is getting tired of seeing that the government can't solve our problems. Some people are getting tired of seeing, oh, education doesn't solve our problems. Wow, they went to Yale, Harvard, amazing schools like UCLA. They're idiots, okay, okay? <laughs> I know, I know firsthand. Look, that, that you don't get it from those schools. You get it from the wisdom that comes from God. So that's the second part of your chart. We move from... Uh, the Old Testament history into the, the church age. And now we get to this seven-year period called the tribulation. Tribulation will end with the Battle of Armageddon. Tribulation is divided into two sections, three and a half years. In the middle is the abomination of desolation at the three and a half year point, And then three and a half years. Notice down here I've got seven scrolls, seven trumpets, seven bowls. These are symbols we're going to see in Revelation. Trumpets were warnings, bump, ba -na -na, get ready, you know, and uh, 
scrolls. You know, we, we've talked about Jesus opening the scroll, revealing the next thing he's going to do to bring about consequences for those who reject him. And hopefully not just to torture people or punish them, but to like make them wake up like a father disciplining his own children that I need to repent and make this right. And many will come to Christ during the tribulation. And it'll end with the seven bowls, which are symbolic of like God using these angels to literally like dump judgment on people. In fact, next week when we're together, we're going to look at the trumpets of doom, seven of them. And, you know, for our climate change environmentalists, like love the planet Earth people, it's going to be a total nightmare because he's going to take out our worship of creation and remind us it's the creator who's in charge, not creation. So we're moving into a seven-year tribulation period. I believe those who are in Christ will be taken up and raptured prior to the tribulation because in Revelation 2 and 3, we looked at the seven churches of Revelation. In chapter 4 and 5, we got a vision of heaven. Remember, John kind of was catapulted and saw that Christ was ruling and reigning in heaven. And in chapter 6, the tribulation, Revelation 6, to 19 covers this orange period here. 6 through 19, and the church is never mentioned once. Hint, hint. Because they're not there. <laughs> they're not in it. Not because we're not supposed to go through hard times. If I thought the tribulation was just difficult times, we probably would go through it because we do go through difficult times. But the tribulation is about judgment. And there's no condemnation for us who are in Christ. So I do tend to think that he's not going to put us through a judgment. He would put us through hard times, but not a judgment. So the church will be raptured. You will receive rewards in heaven. Uh, there'll be the great marriage feast up here. But this is, if, if he comes during our lifetime, this will be a seven-year sabbatical. We'll be taken out for seven years and then we'll come back with him in the second coming, which is after the tribulation. We'll actually come back on earth for the millennial kingdom with him. Now, for loved ones that have passed, by the way, Bill Steele and uh, Patricia lost her mom, uh, Nora, this last week. They just had an amazing funeral yesterday, by the way, in Tennessee. Nora is now with the Lord, not her body. Her body's going to have to wait down here in the grave till the second coming and God will resurrect her body anew. But she is a, a spirit with a, a transitional body waiting in heaven. If the Lord came back today, we would join her as well for a seven-year period and then we'd all come back together with our glorified bodies. So that would be super, super cool. Why don't I pause there? How are we doing? Any questions, thoughts? Are you tracking? Uh, how are we doing with that? There's a lot on here. I don't want you to get too confused by it. I want to try to keep it simple. But I want it to be hopefully encouraging. God's purple. He's done a lot in the Old Testament. Yellow. He's now in the New Testament, uh, the, the church age. But orange is coming. And the good news is when it gets really weird, I think we'll be, we won't be here. Amen? Okay, so let's go on then. Um, after the seven-year tribulation, uh, the second coming will occur. That's when Christ comes back a second time, and we'll come back with him. And he'll usher in what some call the millennial kingdom. He'll usher in the thousand years, what some call just the kingdom age uh, I tend to think it will be a thousand years, literally, but maybe that's symbolic. It, it's some uh, cool period where he will rule and reign on this earth, and the nations will then submit to him and Trudeau. It'll be interesting to see what those cats all do when they're like, sorry, you're actually not in charge. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed kiboshing the truckers while you could. Felt that power, but you don't have it now. And so that, I don't know. Am, am I getting too sadistically excited about that? Or <laughs> I'm like, I'm so excited. This is so great. Because it helps me to go, they're crazy, but let them be crazy for a while. This is all they've got. This is all they've got. But we're going to win this thing in the end. And hopefully Trudeau will come to Christ. You know, he'll realize, you know, after we all take off, a lot of people, remember we taught this last week in Revelation uh, chapter 7, the greatest revival in human history will happen 
during the tribulation period. And think about it, by the way. Seven years is all it's going to take for the whole world to implode. The worst, like, everyone will just, it's between the man of deception, world wars, I mean, it's all going to melt. Once the Holy Spirit is removed in a unique way, and you take Christians out, and the restraint, we, we bring a lot of grace to the world. They may not appreciate it, but once we're gone, it's like crazy land. Anyways, he'll come back and we'll reign with him. That means you'll actually have jobs, you'll function on this earth. And even during the, the kingdom age, Satan's going to be bound um, in a bottomless pit. There'll be uh, some restrictions put on demons and different things. They won't be able to do the havoc that they had seven fun years to really do. Um, it's not over yet, but God's going to like bound them for a time. And he's going to Israel is going to actually take its proper place in, in kingdom history, which will be good. They'll be restored. Of course, many of them, 144,000 of them, come to Christ during the tribulation. So God's not done with his promise. They actually can be a light to the nations, which is super cool. And then after that millennial kingdom, we go into what we call the great white throne. This is recorded for us in Revelation 20. This is the final Judgment. This is the separating. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going to put the sheep and who else? The goats. The sheep and the goats. Like they're ultimately going to be separated in the very end. And all of us will face the judgment seat of Christ. For those of us who are in Christ, we're not going to be judged. The judgment seat is probably better translated for us the Bema seat, which is the awards uh, platform at the Olympic Games. Um, Corinthians does talk about, well, our whole life will be presented to, to, to Christ. I think I put that here, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So some of these you can go back and read. What's in that passage? You know, what does it say? But it says basically, your whole life will be presented before Christ, and he's going to torch it, <laughs> charbecue it, and whatever remains of gold, silver, and precious stones you'll be rewarded for, but whatever is, you know, wood, hay, and stubble will be gone. So if your house burned down, right, even after it burned down, your silverware would still be there, diamond, like certain things would survive the fire, everything else would be gone. And so uh, Paul gives the Corinthian church an illustration, everything that's done for eternal values, everything that God wants, everything that counts, that'll remain, you'll get rewarded for that. But all the other stuff, all those pillows, ladies just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying they're beautiful and no, I'm not touching them, but they're gone, they're gone. Um, <laughs> you'll get rewarded. The judgment seat is actually, uh, there will, it does say Christians will s experience loss. Like there is a sense, I think our lives will be like, that's it? You know, it's like, gosh, I wasted so much of my life. Like, there's so much. I just got into trivial, stupid. Why did I do that? Like there will be, I think, some regret. But he'll wipe the tears away, of course, and we'll, we'll, it, it'll be fitting. What we get will be fitting. Like, that's exactly fair. Like, that's, that's what I deserve. And we'll live with that. But at the end, this judgment seat will happen for all people. And if we've already passed, it's already happened for us. Um, if we live through this period, right, and somehow we're still alive during here, then there'll be a, a great reckoning there. And then we're at the, the very end, which is super cool. Um, at the end there'll be what we call the, the new heaven and the new earth. Think about it, uh, with all these trumpets and scrolls and bowls, God is going to, he's going to thrash the planet. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things burned up and scorched. He's not going to throw the earth away. A lot of people think he's got to do a do-over. Satan just did a number on the world. Remember, we, we, if I had a tree over here, remember we lost rule and reign of the earth and you were usurped by Satan, so he's like the God of this age now. But he doesn't win. We're, Jesus isn't going to go, you defeated us, I've got to start all over. No, no. He's going to take the earth that we have and he's going to remake it. It'll be a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem will come down on the planet and we're going to live here for all eternity. It's super cool. This piece of property, this little square footage of warehouse space will be in the eternal state. I can't wait. We're gonna, we'll, we'll probably have a few little potlucks in this little area. <laughs> Who knows? It's going to look magical, though. I mean, it looks magical now. I know it's so incredible. <laughs> but wait till you see. In other words, there's territory we've taken now 
that we'll see in the eternal state, you know, but it's going to be amazing. There'll be flowers that we've never seen before. I mean, our father is a good father. You know, he, fathers hold back gifts they don't tell their kids about, you know, and they surprise them. And we're going to have everything we have and better. Uh, no, uh, n roses won't have thorns. And we have a rose for all our ladies today. Everyone, everyone who's, who identifies as a lady. <laughs> Can I share our... S <laughs> so some of you know I send out little memes, right? You know, like if you want one, by the way, give me your phone number. We'll, you know, I try to send out what's happening, you know, on Sundays so you're a little heads up or can read ahead. So I sent out a Mother's Day meme yesterday for many of you. And uh, Mike got his. And Mike, you sent back a personal message which said... Yeah, so we got a rose for Mike <laughs> and all the ladies. <laughs> and anyone else who wants to identify as a woman. <laughs> You're so fun. I, I love that you guys are... Uh, you may, uh, humor's got to be his number one strength, right? Uh, no, I just love that you guys are playful and fun. I mean, you take serious the things of God, but you can laugh while we're in a broken world. And uh, anyways, as we get in the news heaven and new earth, they'll come together. Um, remember when Adam and Eve back here walked in the garden, God walked among them. It was like heaven and earth were one. It was only when sin occurred that pff, sin separates and it kind of separated heaven from earth. Um, and God seemed distant and uh, you know there was a gap now and w it wasn't all as integrated. God's going to bring everything back together, head and heart, grace and truth, you know, men and women, uh, new heaven, new earth. It all comes back together. It's so beautiful. In the end, we will no longer be in time. We'll be in eternity. That doesn't mean there won't be chronology or chronos, but there, there won't be time. Time, remember, runs down. Time is a basketball game where you go, you, okay, you got 40 minutes, and it's like, we got two minutes and 10 seconds left, and we're down by 47 points. Bring Jonathan in. We need some three-pointers, dude. Come on, you gotta, you're going to have to sink them because we're behind. <laughs> Uh, time, there's a tyranny to time, like we're running out. You're not going to have that, which would be so... I know some of you will still be in a hurry in the eternal state. You're going to be running... You don't have to do that. We have all time, all eternity. It's like, it's in my top 34. Hurry's number one. <laughs> so this is the day of God. I talked about it in Ephesians. Uh, ultimately, Satan will be thrown in the lake of fire and we'll be done with him um, Jesus conquered way back here. You know, the penalty for our sin is paid for, but the presence of sin isn't gone. That's why we all struggle, right? It's still hard to live it out. It's like, oh, it's paid for, but I still, it's still, the presence of sin will be gone, which would be super cool. So why don't I pause right there and uh, see how you're doing with that. Bernard, you want to help me? And maybe you can, Mark, you want to help me as well? Let's uh, make sure everyone gets a little chart in their hand. Now, I don't know why this happened. But on my chart, um, Bema seat, right here, Bema seat, somehow didn't print. It went real foggy. I wonder if that was the devil. He's like, don't tell them they're going to be rewarded for their faithfulness to you. So you're going to have to write that in. So if you, if you got your glasses, now you have your own chart. But uh, let's just talk briefly about it before we close out. This is a little bit of our teach and talk. And if you're online with us and you have a question or a thought, you're free to go there. And Jerome will try to keep us uh, tracking. Um, but uh, there's a quick overview. So we're in the book of Revelation. So remember, Revelation is Revelation 1 through 5. If I were to write Revelation over this chart, over the gold, I would write like Revelation 1 through 5. Because during the church age, Jesus gives this revelation to John that he's still among the churches and he gives instruction to the seven churches and gives a vision of heaven all now in the church age. In the orange, I would write Revelation 6 through 19 because it's all what, what we're going to. And then this is like Revelation 1920, blue and red. And then Revelation 21 and 22 is green. So we have a lot of good stuff coming up. Anyways, how are you doing? How'd you do? Questions, thoughts, uh, insights? Questions, thoughts. Yeah. Um, during the tribulation, the seven trumpets and so on and so forth, it just reminded me, and I could get this wrong, but it reminded me of like the seven nails and Noah's Ark, so the animals, and you know, obviously seven is a whole number, but I just thought that. 
Yeah, no, that's a great, I love high connectedness in her strengths profile. You're putting stuff together. I love that. Command. Command. <laughs> I think all our girls have that for some reason. No. Um, yeah, and s- Jesus had seven last statements on the cross. Seven is a really significant number. Remember, it's the, n- it's the number of perfection. Uh, so it's a, it's a God number. Uh, sometimes it's literal. Sometimes it's more symbolic. And remember, six is the number of kind of incompleteness, lack, falls short of the glory of God. It's the number of man made on the sixth day. So a triad of sixes, the false trinity, would be a six, six, six. Symbolically, it would be a total man deceptive fake trinity between Satan, the false political leader and the false religious leader. They're like, uh, we're going to read about them coming up in Revelation. So, yeah, that's cool. What else? Yeah, Brother Bill. Where on the chart is your last chance? Well, that's a gr- I love that. You know, one of the things that's so, I mean, it's been really encouraging for me is as we're going through, like just last week when we were looking at uh, the scrolls, the six scrolls and the seventh scroll getting unfurled they had the greatest revival in human history during the tribulation so god is still gracious merciful not wanting any to perish but all to come to repentance even as he's unleashing judgments they're not just i'm going to get you now it's like i'm hoping you wake up how about this one still hoping now a lot of people will double down have you ever noticed that on cnn wow even with evidence they double down But some people are actually like, you know what? I think we got this wrong. I think we need to change. And so I don't think people are coming to Christ in the tribulation. They will come to Christ during the millennial kingdom. And then it's going to be D-Day. And I think you'll even see God have like last call, right? And but he's still, as we know, and Jesus modeled this, right? Remember, he's being crucified. And there's two thieves next to him. And one of the thieves says, I hope you remember me in paradise. And he's like, I'm going with it. Just in time. Then he was gone. I mean, he is a God who wants us to come to him. So I think all the way through, but uh, not in the green. There will be different costs and different... You're so smart. Wow. Whoever nabs you is just so smart. Yeah. Coming to Christ in the yellow is a lot easier than coming to Christ in the orange. I do have a couple people that are like, well, since we'll have a new chance, I think I'll just wait. I'm like, good luck. Because that'll cost you your life, for sure. Like, if you're a Gentile, you're going you're gonna to be killed, for sure. You could get killed now. Uh, and, and it's worth it, by the way, you know, for all eternity to be on your side, but it does get harder. It does get harder, but God's... So leave notes to people, you know, when we rapture, I hope people read, told you, you know. (laughs) Anyways. What about all the people that died before that point? How do they get the second chance? So you're saying, what if someone dies... In the Old Testament. Like in the Old Testament, what is their second chance? That's a great that's a great question. I don't know if they get a second chance in terms of eschatological second chance, but I've always believed that God goes way out of his way to give everyone opportunity. Um, so I don't know how that would flesh out for everyone. Um, if you go back to like Noah, right? He gave him a 120 year warning. I'm building a boat and there's, you know, you're going to need to get on board with me. But still at the end, most people didn't. I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, how much warning do you need? He forecasted. Even when it started to rain, you'd think people would be running to the boat. You'd think the scripture would say, everyone started dashing towards the boat. Hold that boat. <laughs> like a typical cruise for me. It's like <laughs> we were the last ones on the last <laughs> trip we ever took. It's like, we're like, hold it. <laughs> and every plane. And <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I, I mean, there, there are people, I've been with people who said uh, my, my dad passed or my mom passed, and I don't know if they got a second chance. And I'm like, I don't know either, but I wouldn't put it beyond God to do something. God does interesting things. And I have had a few people say, 
you know, the night before they passed, like I felt like I was visited by an angel or I felt like God spoke to me or something my son or daughter told me, connected and uh, I, I want to receive Christ and we give last, last rites and then they're gone. And if we didn't have the thief on the cross and examples like that, I'd be like, I don't know if that's going to count, but it's like, he, he'll count that. But gosh, we some of us are slow learners. Like, don't wait that long, people. <laughs> Good question, Sue. I have never heard anybody say that you could become a Christian during the kingdom age. So the kingdom age is when Jesus is living with us on earth. Mm -hmm. And ruling. Will still be born in sin, or how will they be born? Yeah, I think they will be born in sin because they're not in the eternal state. It's still a fallen world, but it will be a thousand year period of peace and governing as it should be um, and we will reign and rule with him we were designed to govern by the way and uh, all of you uh, may feel like well I don't want to be in charge of a city or anything how about just self-govern <laughs> that's what our whole country is built on right it's like we don't need you to tell us what light bulbs to put in our house like just give us great input and we'll make good choices ourselves like we can self-govern it's one of the fruits of the spirit but some of you will be in charge of a you know, a family or a, a business or maybe a city or something like that and we'll govern with Christ. We were supposed to govern back here but Adam went on a nap time apparently while Satan and his wife had a little kibitz and then <laughs> he decided to join in. It's like, okay, and it's been a train wreck ever since. So. But Satan will be down during that time. Yeah, he will be. So, will be down, so. yeah, this will be a unique period of peace because... Um, you won't have evil uh, thwarting you coming to Christ during that period. Zach? Yeah, that's great. Uh, that we're talking, that's like Ukraine and Russia and how do they fit in. I would put them at the end of the tribulation during the Armageddon. This is when uh, Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Iran... Uh, all, you know, those are named in scripture and Syria and a few others are going to come against uh, Israel and uh, they're going to be more powerful, more, they're going to outnumber Israel. I mean, they're going to like be able to slaughter Israel, but God won't let them. God's going to just wipe them out. He's just going to breathe. And it's like, a lot of people think the battle of Armageddon is going to be like fierce. I, I tend to think it's going to be like the most... <laughs> It's like one of those MFA fights, you know, and the guy on the first punch knocks the guy out, and it's like, we paid a lot of money to come to Las Vegas and see this fight. <laughs> <laughs> and on the first punch, the guy's knocked out, game over. I think Armageddon's going to be like that because God's going to sweep in and knock all these evil nations, including uh, Putin out or whoever rules it. There is a great sermon online on Russia, Ukraine, and Ezekiel 38, 39. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's at the end of the tribulation, the very end, the Armageddon. This is imminent. That's why it's so exciting. I mean, I, this is why I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be excited. This is a really great time in history to be living, you know. Brother. So maybe I'm not sure. Okay, so let's say a believer dies today. Right. Okay, so oh, I'm here at the black dot, and let's say uh, I get hit by a car and I die today. Um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, so my body's going to get buried. Unless my family cremates me because they want to save money or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. No. Cremated, buried, whatever, will be in the ground, and my spirit will go up into heaven. And heaven, this is really like... If I could, okay, heaven is a holding pattern for the eternal state. I, I'm not totally pumped about heaven, to be honest with you. It's going to be amazing and stuff, but it's not harps and clouds, but it's an unembodied, it's a little unnatural. It's a holding pattern till time is consummated, and then we get our new bodies, and then he ushers in the eternal state where we're back embodied as we were created to be, for all time, for eternity. But if I died today, my body would be separated from my spirit and my spirit would be with God and waiting.
to be embodied again, which we'll get on the second coming. And those who are dead in Christ will be raised first. So the people who've already died, the Old Testament saints will get their bodies before the New Testament saints. They'll get them in order. We'll get our new bodies and we'll reign for a thousand years. And then the eternal state. Yeah, they're done. So even the ones that died, uh, born and died before the church age, never had the chance to know Christ. No, they have a chance to know Christ uh, under under the the revelation that God gave them, but it, it wasn't totally like in Christ. Uh, he he took over kind of an Old Testament si system, right? In the Old Testament, you'd have to have a sacrifice, which would be a lamb. And then John says, oh, behold the Lamb of God. Here's like the final lamb. You don't have to keep taking your little pet lamb. You, he's the final lamb. But if they had a lamb, they'd be covered. Even though they didn't know maybe that was Christ per se, but they lived according to God's mandates and precepts, they would be covered. Proxied in. Mark. Yeah, yeah, he's going to try to make it easy at the very end there. Cool, you guys are so smart. Well, let me close us for today. We could go on and on, but uh, today we got a little bit of an overview of where we're going. We're going to be in Revelation chapter uh, 8 next week. We're going to start looking at that tribulation period. What does that look like? But today I want to just make sure I pause and say, mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, ladies, women, thank you for your feminine presence. And, of course, Mike, too. Thank you as well. <laughs> Um, you guys are super fun. I hope you feel respected, revered, esteemed today. I hope you feel loved. We've got a rose for you, just a small token to make sure you know you guys, you guys really rock, and we're super grateful. And the world is very complicated. It, it is complicated, but we need you. Uh, it, 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 you know, us men, we're willing to fight and provide and protect, but we need support and prayer, and we need hope and uh, all the things that you bring. Let's do it together. We're co-regents together. Uh, you bring a lot of harmony and hope and we're super, super grateful. So with that, I'll close this out. Thank you for your online uh, giving. Uh, next week is Trumpets of Doom, Judgments on the God Rejecting, Green New Deal, Climate Change, Earth Worshipping, Environmentalists. <laughs> How's that for a title? Was I too direct? Oh. Anyways, well, that'll be Revelation chapter 8 next week. Um, let me pray for us. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are this, uh, this day for us. Thank you for the ways you honor women. They were the crown of creation. I mean, drum roll, that was it. You created man, said, not good. And then you created woman. It's like, wow, this is very good. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. Uh, today, I hope you, you got glory. I hope we see that Revelation is a reminder that you're victorious, that you rule, you reign, and that our future is dicey as the future is we're secure in you. And we thank you for that. And it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Uh, remember.